Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another chapter in our ongoing Vertical Measures webinar series. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Zach Jones, and I will be your webinar host today. I also moonlight as the marketing coordinator here at Vertical Measures. Today's webinar is titled 10 Critical Factors for Success in Content Marketing and is hosted by none other than our fearless leader, CEO, and founder, Arnie Ken. Arnie was named American Marketing Association's Marketer of the Year a few weeks back and has taken VM from a digital marketing company he ran out of his house 12 years ago to be the cutting edge 50 person company that it is today. Arnie has been knee deep in the digital marketing community for 20 years, so you can say he's been around the block a few times in the industry. Uh, but that's enough complimenting the boss. However, I, before I hand it off, I have three things I wanna go over. Uh, first is we always get the question, will this recording be available? Of course it will be. We email it out to all of our registrants. That includes you after the, or uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, and you could always find any of our previous webinars, including this one uh, at verticalmeasures.com slash webinars. And if any question pops up during the presentation, something on you know that's relevant to you, uh, please ask it in our chat tab and we will try to get to it in the Q&A or we'll try to, you know, we'll try to reach out to you after the Q&A if we don't have enough time. And finally, uh, at the end of the webinar, we have a survey. It's five quick questions. We'd really appreciate it if you took the time to answer. Take just a couple minutes. Uh, it's really easy. It's just multiple choice. Uh, so I'd really appreciate it if you did that. Uh, I think that's all for me. So I am going to hand it off to Arnie. Hey there. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate that except for the around the block a few times part. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll see you in the hallway in a little bit. Yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me. I'm hitting the advance button to see if this will advance. It didn't. Oh, right off the bat, I have a little. There we go. So I know this is showing, or hopefully it's showing a video right now, and it's maybe a little jittery, and I'm going to move past it fairly quickly. Uh, it's a little video we shot uh, when we won the best places to work in Arizona to kind of feature what we're all about, uh, our space, and so on and so forth. Uh, as Zach, uh, I'm going to skip past it now. As Zach had mentioned, we were founded about 12 years ago. Uh, we're currently about 50 uh, uh, different creative and strategic minds that are all full-time employees with a few contractors as well. Uh, and I personally have taught more than 20,000 people all around the world on primarily content marketing, but every once in a while, uh, some SEO uh, as well. And I think it was mentioned we're based in Phoenix. Uh, we have a couple of employees over on the East Coast in Boston. Um, and generally we service uh, mid-size to Fortune 500 clients. Uh, probably our sweet spot would be uh, anybody doing oh, 10, 20 million dollars or more. Um, and you can see some of our represented clients at the bottom there. So that's enough about us. So I wanna start off by basically saying two things. Uh, one is this entire presentation is based on a lot of lessons learned as an agency, uh, working with hundreds of clients over the last, uh, you know, from a content marketing perspective, probably really over the last seven or eight years. Uh, also lessons we've learned by being able to be in front of thousands of people every year uh, in our content marketing workshops. Uh, and so we kind of get to see the front edge, we think of what's happening. We we certainly get feedback from, from all of those people uh, as well as our clients. And uh, the 10 things I'm gonna walk through today is based on real hard life lessons. And uh, as I end this presentation, I'm gonna give you some examples of how we, we, we measure everything uh, and we study what's working and not working for our clients. And I'm gonna kind of summarize it there. But I thought as usual, I would start with a real definition of content marketing. Uh, you saw the little video clip there. Maybe you saw this uh, as I was walking in that front door. Uh, but this is literally in our lobby. And I get teased that I took this picture with my cell phone and I left that uh, tissue box in the scene and all that stuff. But the message here is really just this definition that, that our employees and our visitors see uh, whenever they come through the front doors. And it's basically, and I think it's, it would be accepted by anybody in the industry today, uh, but it's basically, it's the art of providing relevant, useful content to your customers without selling or interrupting them. That's a big difference from uh, the, the hundreds of years of marketing uh, prior to this. And instead of pitching your products or services, you're delivering information that makes your customers more informed before they buy. And, and that's the bottom line, but it gets confused a lot. People still want to insert their brand into everything they do. 
they still want to find a way to interrupt and, and sell and pitch and it's all about them and that's not how it works today not online anyway so hopefully i'm going to cover this in about 30 minutes uh but if you can get past these 10 issues that i'm going to, going to talk about you might see results similar to this and this is not uh, vertical measures cherry picking specific clients this is literally the average of all of our current clients and the results that they have seen if they follow our recommendations and get past some of these uh, gotchas uh, in the in the process and their strategy to becoming successful basically with digital marketing but this is their organic growth that the average client sees when working with us so after 90 days usually what that means is we've managed to fix a few things you know fairly quickly they see a nice little jump in organic traffic of about 20 percent and then kind of the slog hits where you just keep slugging away and you keep producing content, you keep fixing uh, maybe some technical issues uh, from an SEO perspective, whatever it might be, you start doing some social media, but you only see a slight increase on average. But after a year, our average client sees 66% growth in organic. And after two years, our average client sees almost a 200% increase in orga organic growth. Uh, growth. Sorry about that. And so I'm showing you this not necessarily to uh, sell vertical measures, but to let you know that th we know for sure what the process is, what process works and what doesn't work. And so a lot of what I'm going to focus on is how we can help get you across this chasm qu uh, quicker than learning the mistakes all maybe on your own. And so generally what we've seen and the industry was kind of talking about this a lot in uh, 2017, so we created this graphic. This can actually apply to almost any business, uh, uh, releasing of, of almost any new significant product. Generally what happens is, you know, you think, oh, I've got the best idea ever. I'm gonna start a business. I'm gonna launch this product, uh, whatever. Uh, and you realize that getting that product or that service or your digital marketing ready, uh, you're learning a lot. You realize, of course, it's a lot of hard work generally you start to think this was a big mistake you're overwhelmed you start to look who you can blame this on and you know maybe you want to blame it on me because you went to our workshops or you you've talked to me somewhere or you watched this presentation uh you know and, and then you start to think well it still stinks stinks but i sense that it's we're making progress we're starting to actually see traffic gains and if you follow that that previous slide Generally, you might have to wait a minimum of six months, and it could be a year, which is unlike anything marketing's ever had to do before. You know, ask your bosses and your executive suite to buy in and be patient and know that this is actually a long-term investment. It's just that's something marketing has not had to do for the hundreds of years prior to this. And eventually, hopefully, you say, yeah, we get it. We're gaining traction. And hopefully, someday you say, man, this was worth it. We're way ahead of our competition. It's starting to really pay off now. It was one of the be better investments we've ever made. So I'm going to walk you through an idea of how to how to in, uh, have belief and persistence and get across this chasm much quick, much more quickly. So the first thing, I'm going to do the whole David Lemmerin thing, except for David's funny, and actually he's not on the air anymore, but I'm going to kind of reverse down from 10 to number one. They're not necessarily in order of importance at all, uh, so don't necessarily perceive it that way. Uh, but I'm going to start off. Number 10 is, uh, and this is fairly new, we used to have actually uh, eight steps, and we've uh, this year updated it to 10 and modified some of those eight. So it's a brand new presentation. It's the first time I've actually ever given this version of it. Um, so basically we want to, to, to convince you that one of the key ways to look at your digital marketing and certainly your content marketing is that you're trying to build your own audience, not an audience for YouTube or Twitter or uh, Facebook or, or somebody else uh, rent or renting your audience, but an audience where they've get provided you their uh, personal information, maybe their name, their email address, uh, job title, website, whatever it might be. But it's basically defined as anyone who's engaged with your organization in almost any fashion. So we've actually identified three, or we put together three different tiers that would describe three different audiences. So the first one, and probably I would say the least valuable one, um, it, tier three is a short-term thing where, where when someone visits your website, maybe you've run ads, uh, 
produced a piece of content, whatever it is that pulls them originally to your website, which is where it all pretty much starts, you're able to pixel them or, or give, you know, put a cookie on them. And that might time out in 30 days, 90 days, you know, whatever it might be. And of course, we have to be careful these days with the whole GDPR uh, thing coming down and get permission for all of this. Um, but then you, the possibility is that you could retarget this audience by running ads on other websites as they're, they're moving around the web. And again, it's probably uh, the least valuable audience you could build, but it's still an audience nonetheless. The second one, tier two, is what we would call a non-owned audience. So I, I kind of hinted at that uh, uh, just a minute ago, but this would be people who, who have maybe subscribed to your YouTube channel, uh, they're your podcast subscribers, they're, they're following you on Facebook, Twitter, uh, maybe Google+, Plus, uh, wherever it might be. Um, and that's good, you can reach them, not necessarily when you want to, or uh, always, at all times. And the, the, the challenge here is that these audiences can leave you, right? It leave you meaning that what happens if, if Twitter actually decides to close tomorrow? I realize that's highly unlikely, but there have been other social media platforms that have gone by the wayside. They happen to own that audience, and if, they, if it goes down with them, you no longer have that audience. So to us, the most valuable thing you can do is build up what we would call a tier one audience or an audience that you own based on people subscribing to your content, subscribing to your blog, uh, downloading your information and providing their information to get it. It could also be uh, LinkedIn connections. And the reason we add that here is because you can actually reach out to your LinkedIn connections at the time and place of your choosing. And of course it includes your customers who could be one of your most valuable assets. So that's that's ten. It's, that's number ten. Thinking about how you can build your own audience, something that that again becomes a very valuable asset for your business. So the next thing is is that you have to really understand it's time to amplify your content. When we were first really uh, working hard with our clients, and, and and I think the whole industry when it came to content marketing, when it started to roll out, when Joe Polizzi formed the Content Marketing Institute, and then later on Content Marketing World, and, and really was the guy who led the phrase content marketing over the last decade, uh, people kind of had this attitude of, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and that's not so true anymore. I mean, we're all producing, well, many of us are producing content on a very consistent basis, basis your, your competition is. And so the difference uh, today, I think, is that you absolutely have to build into your strategy, into your plan, a method to amplify your content. And, and what you're seeing here is, uh, I think what we're becoming pretty well known for is our, the hub and spoke model that we roll out for ourselves and for our clients. Uh, we've taught other agencies how to do this, and it's it's reasonably simple. I'll just take, you know, maybe 20 seconds to walk through it. But the idea is, and and, and how we roll it out, the timing is every 90 days we roll out a new, what we call a hub. So this would be a really valuable educational piece of content that might be as simple as an ebook. It could be a video training series. It could be a, a, a in-depth white paper, but something that someone would be willing to exchange their information in order to get it. And then during the 90 days after that release, and again, if you follow the every, you know, once a quarter schedule, you could do this every 30 days if you have the resources or whatever it might be, you start to do things to amplify it. And here's a bunch of examples. So it could be an you know, infographic, it could be uh, running a webinar like this. And at the end, you have a call to action to take them back to this hub. Uh, in fact, I'm sure we'll mention a, a couple of pieces of our own content during this. Uh, it could be offsite articles you've written, press releases you pu pu push out, uh, emails to your current audience, um, and of course, advertising. And the message really here is not only does this hub and spoke model work beautifully and it allows you to, to, to kind of simplify a, a strategy for your team, uh, but the other thing to, to remember is you will probably want to set aside a budget to help amplify your content. Um, for those of you who've been doing marketing for a long time, been around the block, uh, you probably have run some TV ads, uh, uh, you, know, you know, maybe radio, print, whatever it might be. And if you think about how that was done, is you would take your marketing budget and maybe, maybe 5% or 1% or 0% of it went to creating the content. You know, if you had a large enough advertising budget, the, uh, the media outlet might create the ads for you. If you, you know, if you could spend whatever it is, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, they would certainly create the ads for you. So most of the budget went to amplifying that content. 
And in content marketing, that kind of got flipped where people thought, well, 100% of our budget is going to go to creating content. And what I would say, uh, my observation is going forward, you should try to figure out how you can slice off a chunk of your budget. And I, I, everybody's going to uh, uh, have a different number. So you know, whether it's 10% or 50% of your budget, uh, your content marketing budget, and, and hold that aside so that you can amplify it later. You can run some ads and promote what seems to be working and converting for you uh, in, a, in, a, in a very strong fashion. And this is only going to continue to grow, the movement towards digital. Uh, if you can see the yellow clearly enough there, this represents uh, today, uh, or actually this was uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, at, through 2019, I think it's projected that digital will now be about 45% of your total marketing spend. And it's primarily been at the expense of, uh, of print. Print has you know, paid the biggest price over the last, whatever this is, uh, 18 years. Radio's held fairly consistent. TV, you know, they've flattened out, but digital is where it's, where it's growing uh, the most. And that's probably why you're watching or listening to this webinar later. So number eight, and this actually, you know, uh, I suppose we internally we might all have different uh, viewpoints here at Vertical Measures about what if we had to rank these what would be most important. I view this as one of the more critical things uh, for you to be successful with your digital marketing. And and I don't know if you can see the number eight there, but that the executive team has to lead the way, and not necessarily do. They just have to understand. The, the, the stuff I just talked about previously and the rest of what I'm going to talk about in this 30 minutes or 35 minutes, uh, but they they have to understand. They have to understand the difference between co pure content marketing and marketing of old. They need to understand the resources it takes. It need, they need to understand that it's an actual longer term investment. Uh, it's much like uh, uh, getting them to understand they need to, this is buying a house as opposed to renting the house. Um, and if they understand, then they can help knock roadblocks down and clear the path for you to actually get this done. And too often we've seen where the executive team was not brought in, and I'm talking about the higher levels, the C level, uh, if they weren't brought in, they they weren't advised, they weren't informed as to why and what, what we're doing and why we're doing it, uh, a few months in, they want to stop it because they see this money going out the door and no one has educated them on, on uh, what the investment side of this really is. Um, and so here's one simple example. This is two of our clients. Uh, they're both in the B2B space. They started working with us uh, literally the same month. It just all turns out to be pretty coincidental, but it's turned out to be a pretty good case study of, of uh, case in point of what, what I'm just talking about from an executive buying perspective. One client, totally got it. Uh, their their uh, uh, CEO was on board, understood, uh, cleared the path, knocked down whatever he had to to make sure that, that, that their team and he actually got involved in helping create content. And, the, and that is represented in blue. And the other one was a little bit more of a bottleneck. He, he was a little bit unsure. Uh, he wanted to make sure everything was absolutely perfect uh, before uh, he would even approve it. He actually, actually put himself in the approval process. And here's the difference in, in graphic form of how those two uh, different businesses perform from an organic traffic perspective over about a two year period. And you can see what happens when the executive is on board and, and like I say, clearing the way, uh, the results were literally eight times greater for that company than the other company. So some ways you can get executive buy-in, if show them some case studies, uh, maybe presentations like this, uh, could be a, a, an on-site workshop. Um, uh, where we, you know, the internet's, our site is filled, filled with these, the internet is filled with case studies where it actually works. And a lot of people now certainly have learned and support the idea that this takes some time, which is the next thing you need to be honest. You need to have, you know, serious candor with the executive suite. And if I ever get involved in the sales process or with a client later on, you know, I'm the CEO of our company, so I can be, uh, well, one, I've learned a lot and I can be pretty darn direct and uh, totally honest that this is going to take a while. And I've had to get involved in, in, in several of those meetings over the years, many, many meetings over the years. And once they start to see and understand what the possibilities are and that we've been honest from the, from the beginning, uh, they, they will tend to be supportive. Uh, also, you can show them what the competition is doing, right? What, what, what examples are out there of where the, you're losing to the competition because they're producing awesome content, they're promoting their content. Um, and so I'm gonna 
continue on now with the last seven uh, uh, methods of avoiding that 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 pit of despair. That that thing I showed you right off the bat. That got it. Yeah. Alrighty. So foster a culture of content. That that is, again, if the C-suite can help you do this, that's all the better. In fact, they they really should. They need to understand that this is that's what it, this is all about. Is creating this culture of content marketing, culture of just creating content at every opportunity. And a, a couple of ways, you, or not, not a couple, but a few ways you can do this is to make content a priority. Uh, when we were really getting into this seven or eight years ago, you know, we were just encouraging, and I even had to get really used to this idea, but we were encouraging people to take pictures, shoot video, jot down notes, uh, email our marketing manager uh, with a content idea. And we did, and, and what we kept telling people was, you know, do all of that. It doesn't mean we'll publish it. If you hate that video or that picture you took or whatever, then we don't, we just delete it. We don't need to publish it. But if, if, if it turns out it's awesome and we can put it out on Facebook or on our website or build a blog post around it or a really helpful uh, ebook, then let's do that. But it just really has to be uh, something that people are thinking about every day, every hour. What's an opportunity to, to create some content? And like I mentioned, it, this means everybody. Free up everybody. It could be the warehouse, delivery people, uh, people that just run into unique experiences. It could be out in their personal life and they see a funny sign and they want to take a picture of that sign because somehow it relates to, to what you do or doesn't relate to what you do. I mean, you know, whatever it is you decide to post. And, and also remember that you can't outsource all of this. And I'll talk about that in an upcoming slide, but you're, you are basically in almost every case, everybody listening to this um, need to understand that you are actually the subject matter experts. And a lot of you have already probably experienced this where you've tried to outsource the content and you're just disappointed because this writer that you've paid less than $100 to just doesn't understand your complex business. Well, of course. Right, you live it, you breathe it, you started it maybe. Um, so ideally, you can help create a lot of the content and maybe work with a, an agency or a subcontractor or whatever it is to either be your editor or you know finalize the content or pull an interview from you or whatever it might be. But you guys really, really need to, to own and believe that, that you're the best at, at, at whatever it is, whatever product or services that, that you're offering and that you know it better than anybody else and you need to let that expertise come across. The other thing I would recommend is considering rewarding people. Um, again, at, at Vertical Measures, we give a bonus for every blog post that somebody produces. So we have a whole team here. You know, you know, and remember, I'm in the same boat. We are in the same boat as most of you listening. You know, we, uh, uh, when when we decided we were going to go all in on content marketing several years ago, we struggled with the the having the time and the resources to produce content as well. I, in the beginning, I wrote blog posts at night. You know, it's just everybody has the same issue. You're not unique if your concern is, well, how are we going to get this done? We don't have time. We don't have, you know, no, nobody has time. Nobody has resources, but your competition's finding a way to get it done. And so a, a tip here might be that you reward contributors uh, with a small bonus if they turn in that piece of content on time and maybe with a few minimum requirements. Like I, I think we, you know, you have to have so many words in a piece of content here, maybe provide a couple of images and it certainly has to be turned in on time uh, in order for you to get your bonus. And we let everybody work on the content during the business hours if they want to, that's fine with us. Some work, uh, you know, just work better at home. So so maybe they'll, they'll work, 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 work on it at home. And then what's also important is we share the results with everyone. We, I see a little message flagging here. I don't know if that's for me or not. No, nope. uh, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, we share the results. So uh, a couple of things we mean by that is uh, like today, an email went out to our staff because we launched a new blog post this morning. And Zach, who spoke at the very beginning of this webinar, uh, sent an email out with some example tweets and some ways to share it socially. So one is the entire company now knows that a piece of content just went live today. And two, there's a chance that some of them will share it on their social platform. We don't make anyone do that, but we make it very easy if they choose to do so, which helps make that, that content creator uh, feel good about the, their efforts and so on. Uh, and then the other thing we do is every month we give an award for the best piece of content that was produced uh, for vertical measures in that month. And I don't even remember exactly what it is, but I think they get a, a maybe a half day PTO and another small cash bonus and they get a trophy that goes on their desk. So we celebrate it. We just make it a part of everything we do. And then lastly, you want to facilitate ideation. 
uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in another slide. Uh, but I, when I look at lots of prospective client sites and client sites, uh, some that maybe we've even worked on, uh, one of the things I start to do is go through the content and just look at their titles. And I can tell fairly quickly if they truly grasp the idea of content marketing based on just the titles of their various content alone. And, and so it all starts with really doing some research in developing ideas for content. And just the, the phrase that I say over and over and over again, if you're not successful with content marketing yet, you need to be thinking about, are you creating content that people are actually searching for? The metrics just show that people are still finding you via search. And so it's important that the title and the content you're creating is something someone actually might search for. So number six, do you have a written uh, strategy? I will tell you, uh, I know that HubSpot's published this, Content Marketing Institute, uh, Marketing Profs, they've all published this research. And in our own little world here at Vertical Measures, it absolutely flips every time. And it flips when we go to our workshops and we ask people how many people are successful with content marketing. And the ones that don't raise their hands almost inevitably are the same ones that say they don't have a written strategy. So you really need to create a strategy, write it down, and share it with the teams that are involved, starting at the top. Um, so, I, I, you know, of course, we don't have time to go through how to create a content strategy. Uh, I do believe, uh, I'll ask Zach right now, uh, if we can send a link out, we do have a whole guide, a, a guide you can download on how to build a, a strategy. Uh, but the basic elements are you need to understand what your business's goals are, right? And, and, and hopefully the, uh, those are defined already. You need to understand what your audience needs are. You know, what problems are they trying to solve? What, what, when they turn to, to Google in the United States anyway, to Google and begin their search to try to solve their problem, what is it they're typing into those, that search bar? You know, what, 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 uh, you know, what is the need? What, what problems are they trying to solve? Uh, what is your current state? In other words, what content do you already have on, on, on your website? How does it map to your customer's journey? Do you have gaps? You know, uh, how's your uh, site infrastructure uh, holding up? And you just need to understand where you stand today so that you know how to move forward. Uh, what strategic initiatives do we have? Are we trying to uh, double our lead volume, a high quality lead volume in the next 24 months? Um, you know, what, whatever those measurable uh, goals are out there, you need to understand those as well. So you can build a strategy that lines up with those initiatives and then create a content roadmap that includes ideation, includes content uh, research. Um, so you're basically laying out this plan and we're and when we do it for clients it's a pretty flexible plan um you know generally we're we're probably able to lay out the details only for about 90 days out we have a general idea for the the coming 12 months what's going to be done what are you know how what goals do we have in front of us uh, uh, you know again what is it, what's our per persona what do our personas look like what's our audience needs so on and so forth but the the details and usually they hover hover around that hub and spoke model uh, usually we have a detailed map for about 90 days and then lastly actually I'm going to cover this in my next slide but I think this is one of the other areas that are is critical to have which is understanding the governance of this process and this content so we would recommend a table and we try to get this done with every client we have a table that looks something like this where we follow the what we call the racy method so we know who's responsible who's an who's accountable or an approver who needs to be consulted who needs to be informed for all of these what are these eight different nine different steps in the in the in the strategy in the process so from ideation through editing, through approving, through publishing, through amplifying it, and then measuring the results. Who are the individuals that are responsible for each of these four things, the RACI, uh, each of those steps? And I will tell you, probably a lot of you are nodding right now. I can't see you, but nodding that this, this is a problem. And we've created content for clients that have never, it's never been published, which is terribly frustrating for us and the client. And it's because we just, in the past and maybe even presently, we've missed understanding who needed to approve this, who needed to be consulted. Uh, and, and I will say a lot of times it's either branding or IT that tends to be where we miss it. And we've waited and waited for months for something to go, get pushed live because there was a, such a backlog at the IT department. 
And so you need to really understand that. And maybe again, if you go all the way back to, to the, one of the first things I talked about, having the executive team on board, they might be able to clear some of these hurdles for you if they understood really what, what it took to become successful. So optimizing your content, uh, you know, I pretty much started uh, the agency and started my life uh, in uh, internet marketing really as an SEO. Uh, so this is near and dear to me. And many of you have probably seen this. We've been showing this for a few years. It's still funny, I think. So here it is for you as well. So I'm gonna show you a stat, but it's really, really true. If you actually have a dead body you need to hide, you might wanna to try to place it on page two of Google search results. Uh, and the reason is, well, actually that's the second thing I'm gonna show you. But the reason we wanna care so much about search and Google is that 93% of purchases begin with a search. And again, in the United States and most countries, uh, it's Google. And uh, you know, you all know that because when you went to buy your last uh, pair of shoes or your a car or a sales automation platform or whatever, whatever prompted you uh, to say, yeah, we, we might need this, whatever this is, we almost instinctively turn to a search engine. And this, the data bears this out. 93% of the time, that's what we do. We start our investigation online. And the reason you don't want to be on page two is 92% of the searchers, us and your, your, your potential customers, your prospects, do not click past page one of Google search results. Right. So what and we used to, you know, years ago, we would, oh, uh, you know, I, I did my keyword search and it must be here somewhere. Well, we don't do that anymore. Now we lengthen our search. We adjust our search. We scroll through page one. If we don't see a, a really good result that strikes our interest or we click through it a couple and we, and we bounce back because it wasn't quite what we we're looking for, we'll, we'll add words to that search. We'll, we'll refine that search, but we don't click through lots of Google pages. So if your SEO team is really proud of all the top 100 rankings you have, you might show them that stat. We, you gotta find a way to get things moved to page one. And then remember too, or we not remember, but uh, that the other key is that for the average website, about a little over 50% of the traffic you get is driven by organic, right? So that, that's just how people are going to naturally find you. So some real, real, real quick here. Some of the most common SEO problems are, uh, and you can talk to us later about some of these if you like, but they're unintentional duplicate content is something we consistently see on websites when we're auditing the site. You've got to have uh, fast loading pages. I think pretty much now the benchmark is under three seconds for every element of a page to load. And that's really driven by the whole mobile thing. Uh, your, every single page now, it's a mobile first index in Google. So you need to make sure you have a mobile friendly uh, site. And, and fortunately, most of the sites that we're seeing today ha have taken care of this. Uh, you want to make sure you have good HTML and meta tags. I know that they don't, uh, appear nearly as important to SEO as they did, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, or even three years ago, but they're still important because that's what generally show generally shows up in the search results uh, on Google. So you want to make sure you have your title tags in place. You want to make sure you have solid uh, HTML and things are not bloated and so on and so forth. Uh, you want to make sure you have solid backlinks pointing to various pages uh, in your site. There's still, it's probably still the number one factor to getting ranked highly uh, in Google search results. And then of course, and I, I forget the exact date, but sometime in July, uh, you pretty much better be a have a secure site and Vertical Measures is going to get that done this weekend. Uh, but you want to have a secure site uh, because it, it, Google's going to, uh, a lot of the browsers are going to start giving notices that this is a non-secure site. So if you if you offer, if, I'm sorry, if you're collecting any information from people visiting your website, you need to have a secure site. Oh, sorry, there was one more. So thin or unoptimized content. So I, I pretty much talked about that, but you know, you can't cheat anymore. This all takes a lot of effort. I get asked all the time at, at workshops and conferences, you know, I've been around a long, you know, Arnie, you've been around a long time. There must be a silver bullet. There must be some magical way to get through all this. And unfortunately, it re there really isn't. You have to be smart, that's for darn sure, but it still takes all the elbow grease. You have to outwork your competition. All right, number four, uh, prioritize your audience 
over your brand. And again, I, we still get hung up on this with some, some prospects and clients that, you know, we, oh, we've got to find, follow our branding guidelines or it's all, you know, they, they are just, they just can't help themselves. They have to talk about them and their products and their services. But maybe this slide would convince you a little bit that, and if I haven't already, but, but people don't, you know, if they're turning and, and uh, uh, adding your brand to a search, well, then you've kind of already won. I mean, you already have that brand exposure. But what this slide, very quickly, what this basically says is that most consumers today, uh, and this is you know B2B or B2C, so I said consumer, but it applies to both, we're just not lo that loyal anymore. You know, we are with certain things like at the bottom of this list, you know, mobile carriers, right? We just don't change mobile carriers very often. We don't change auto and uh, auto insurance or investments very often. But other things, as you can well imagine, we're not that loyal. It's just too easy to shop, to gain information and shop and buy online. So you need to be, you need to be putting that, that helpful, useful information in front of those people when they're online looking for it. So the other thing is, let's just say you've made it all the way through all this. You've gotten the executive team on board. You've written your strategy. You're producing content. You're starting to build your audience. And, and of course, there are many businesses that have made it that far and are feeling successful. But the next thing that I see that I think gets overlooked is nurturing the leads that you're actually generating. All right. So. Again, you've put in all this energy and this investment, uh, all this time, and you, and you finally got them to your site and you've actually captured them and they've downloaded this ebook or followed your little training series or maybe signed up for a webinar like ours or whatever it is. The key now is to follow up with those people. And what this slide here shows, and this is kind of a stunning one for me, but you could look at the age brackets, which is really important. The bottom one, it doesn't matter though what age they're in. The bottom one is that people still prefer to be followed up with via email. That's their preferred channel to hear from you, no matter what age group they're in. Now, the, the one that surprises me is that the second one from the bottom is still postal mail, but that's where you need to look at the ages. You know, the younger people don't even know what mail is, right? They don't, uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm in the older generation and I, I mean, what I get our mail every once in a while, I stand at the recycle bin and I literally, and, you know, I mean, everybody knows they do that with the yellow pages, but I mean, I, I literally stand there and I see my neighbors doing the same thing with their mail, just tossing it into the, you know, whatever they don't want that's not important right into the recycle bin. Um, so, you know, maybe if your demographic is targeting uh, a retirement community or whatever, postal mail might still be important, but email and then up to text messages and surprisingly, you know, social media and online videos from, a, from again, from a lead nurturing perspective uh, is not exactly the preferred channel. So anyway, that's, there's that message. Heading towards the end here. So you want to also make sure you're testing, learning, and iterating. So again, you can be doing all of this, including the last thing I talked about, lead nurture. But if you're not measuring, if you're not testing and constantly trying to improve each of these, each of the components that go into a great content marketing strategy and great content marketing effort, then you're leaving uh, in my view, leaving money on the table. So do CR, uh, CRO, conversion rate optimization. Try changing the colors of the different buttons or the wording on, on the call to actions that you have and, and, and be really careful about how you do that. You know, you want to do strict, in my view, strict A-B testing. So you're not you know, inserting multiple variables, but learn, learn, learn what kind of content you're creating that is really outperforming all the other types of content and get and just keep doing more of that, right? So constantly measure and adjust. So uh, from a measurement perspective, what, basically the, the easiest way to go about this is you wanna understand what are relevant questions to you and your business goals, like we talked about. If, 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 if you create that strategy from the beginning that foots back to your business goals, then as you're measuring things, you wanna know and ask yourself, how is this affecting and how does this foot to my business goals? Look at those insights and then uh, of course, take action. And uh, remember that whole racy thing, you know, who's responsible, who's accountable, you know, who needs to be informed. It even goes all the way back to this process because this is going to tell you, oh, here's the changes I need to make. Who's in, who's in the way and who's gonna support me on getting these changes made. So you wanna measure things that are specific, uh, actually measurable, they're actually attainable, relevant, and time-bound. 
right? I, I want to achieve this number of leads, this increase in revenue, this much uh, new organic traffic uh, by the end of the year, or by you know maybe some you know, if you're in the education business, maybe you want to have it done uh, by September or you know whatever it is. I mean, they're even becoming a pretty year-round business, uh, but you want to look at those things, and then. My last tip on measurement anyway, is you wanna really have the process for reporting to the right people the right information. And so for, for our clients, uh, a lot of our clients, uh, they're gonna hear about this in July, but we're rolling out this platform for them to where they can customize it based on who wants to see what. And so I, I tell people a lot in our, in our workshops that if internally, or if I was a CEO uh, for another company and I was sent a 20 or 30 page PDF to review for, uh, what is this, June's, uh, June's data, you know, for, for vertical measures or whatever company I might represent, yeah, I'm you know, probably gonna see that it's a 20 page, 30 page report, uh, quickly close it. And I might think to myself, I'll read this later, but I never do. So for so when you're providing data to people, understand who your audience is, and I think it's important to know what your what does your executive team want, what does middle the middle management need, and what do the analysts need, and that's for the same month or the same quarter, the same year, they're all going to want to look at different things, and from a, a again a, an executive level, pretty much all they care about is is, is revenue growing. That, that's the bottom line, and and. I would say a lot of times if a report came to me, but everything's just working smooth and we're I'm happy as can be at vertical measures, I might not even bother to look at the report because I, I kind of don't care. I don't need that level of detail. If if revenue starts to slip, now I might click through and say, hmm, I wonder, hmm, I wonder, and, and start to ask some questions. And then last, and this is one of the ones that could be debated for us uh, it, uh, amongst, you know, what's most important, what's not most important. I tend to believe it all starts at the, at the executive suite. But in the end, it really is all about implementing. It's all about executing. You can have the strategy. You can have the executive team on board. Uh, you can understand, you can optimize really, really well. Uh, you can understand your metrics and so on and so forth. But if you're not actually implementing what's being recommended to you to implement or stuff you know that has to happen, producing and publishing the content, making the SEO adjustments, running a paid campaign. If you're not actually implementing, uh, then generally you're going to fall behind. And a lot of times we see it get hung up or someone says, oh, this isn't quite perfect. Um, and I would, and, and I gave you that one example and I'll give it to you again. Uh, but I would say that uh, over the years, Vertical Measures has grown from basically two of us to 50 of us uh, because we weren't hung up on being absolutely perfect. Our website is not perfect today. The content we've produced over the years, and especially stuff I wrote, was not perfect, but I never got called out for it. People found us. They started to believe in us. They trusted us. They started doing business with us because we just kept consistently producing content. So remember this, this is the difference, right? That's the one CEO was on board, made sure that it happened and they consistently produced content and they outperformed the other company a uh, factor of eight to one over two years in a, virtually the same industries, same size companies during the same period of time. And I told you we measure everything. This might even be the last slide. I told you we measure everything and without disclosing who our clients are and who's who's at the top, who's at the bottom, we we literally watch, and, and this is a, a chart we show to our company, our full company every month. Um, so all the clients in the blue have positive organic growth. The clients off to the left in red have negative. I just wanna also say, <laughs> We have never, that I know of, in the last few years, ever made a client's growth go negative. They've normally come to us, and it's they're and they come to us because their grow, organic traffic is slipping. It's 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 in a downward curve, not an upward curve. And so we're trying to fix it. The ones that are stuck to the left hand side of this chart are the ones that are not implementing. We we just we know we know the difference between the successful clients and the non-successful clients. And it almost always boils down to getting the job done. 
a lot of the clients, even on the left, know what has to be done. We've given them, we've given them, or they know internally what needs to be done. They just have not built the strategy and put the systems in place. And I keep using this, you know, over and over again, but to to clear those hurdles, to get the job done, and that's really key getting the processes the strategy the things in place and we can we, you know we help our clients do that the ones that are open to it um but the ones that are just saying well this is the way we've always done it or i can't get sign off or i can't get this they tend to be on the left hand side there we go Whew. that's the end thank you very much i'll we'll turn it over to zach that was really great arnie thank you uh i do have one piece of advice though if you don't want people saying you've been around the block a lot don't mention the <laughs> yellow pages uh the yellow pages really really date you well <laughs> now zach don't you get the yellow pages uh, i i i barely even know what they are aren't, aren't we forced to get the yellow pages i don't know do we still get them i don't i don't remember getting one they, they show up in my driveway once a year well, they so, just know you're yeah. you're their target audience. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> they have my address. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's get into the questions. Uh, the first one is from Stephanie, and she says, "How can you really convince leadership that content marketing means you should spend marketing dollars to amplify your content rather than produce it and put it out on your website, social channels, etc., for the people to find?" Uh, she uses the "if you build it, uh, they will come" approach as the example. Yeah. Uh, great question, Stephanie, right? Yes. Yep. Uh, thanks for asking that. So, and I think we have a few, I'll try to be brief, but here's what I would recommend is generally proof works. So uh, I do know there's, uh, I, I probably won't say this on air because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to or not, but I know that there's a, a large uh, organization in the NBA that has become quite famous over the last few years uh, because of their NBA play uh, that their team uh, will release a piece of content and they will spend literally like $50 uh, maybe Facebook or some social media platform um, and they'll just see if it gets some traction and if it and if it gets some traction then they might actually add a hundred or two hundred or three hundred dollars and if they turns out it's really working and they're getting download or, you know whatever the goal is right downloads or views or you know whatever every individual situation might be different but if they're if 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 it's a, uh, getting traction at the price they're willing to pay per whatever then management is usually totally on board so it doesn't have to be thousands and thousands of dollars to start with it can be a small amount just to uh, um, uh, get that uh, proof of concept out of the way. So that, that's what I would recommend, start small. Okay, and so this is, this is our next question. It's also from a, it's from a different Stephanie and uh, also <laughs> from uh, Becca, they kind of asked a similar question. Uh, Stephanie asked, I'm currently in a B2C organization. What are some things to be aware of when crafting a B2C content marketing strategy what are the key differences between a B2B and B2C content marketing strategy? And Becca just added to that by uh, mentioning she's in the healthcare and uh, which is more B2C than B2B. Yeah, uh, could be. Yeah, I mean, yes. we actually have a couple of healthcare clients that are, are B2B. Um, you know, they sell products to uh, medical offices and so on. Uh, but the, the short answer is there really isn't a huge difference in if, in following the steps that I outlined or creating your strategy. It, I know everybody's perception, and it's, you know, it's probably true. Perceptions are almost usually true, but but it's it's a, a common thing to think is that, oh, B2C can be way more fun. There's a lot more opportunity. Um, uh, you know, if you're gonna, oh, I'm in the travel space or, you know, whatever it is. And so it's easy to write for. Uh, in my view, creating the strategy and following the, the 10 uh, steps, or at least uh, 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 making sure these things aren't affecting you in a negative way, really apply almost equally to B2C and, and B2B. And I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I'm not gonna be able to answer it precisely and precisely for healthcare, but generally, if you do your uh, content research, the ideation process, and you understand what your audience is looking for, which is the key to all of this, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, or whether it's B2C, B2B, nonprofit, it just doesn't matter if you follow the principles. And, and some industries, uh, you know, that are really, you know, like I, I just literally taught, literally taught a workshop to all B2B companies uh, up in Seattle, and some of them produce uh, products that I have no idea what they even do. Um, uh, I mean, seriously, they, they, they sell them in some pretty complex industrial environments. 
but there's people buying them. They have a need. They're trying to solve a problem. And they don't need maybe as large an audience as uh, a casino in uh, Las Vegas needs, right? So it, it so the principles apply. You just might have to be happier if you're in the B2B space with fewer views because uh, uh, the ROI is different for you than if you're in the B2C space and you just need to bring somebody in the door. Hopefully that was clear. Yeah, no, no, it was good. <laughs> okay, so this one's from Joyce. Uh, it's kind of a, we're going to go a different direction here. All right. We no longer have a blog on our website. We have articles in our resource center. Would we benefit from creating a blog page and moving the articles there? Yeah, that's a good question too. So, uh, you know, uh, it all depends, but I, I don't, th you know, uh, I think blog is the default and I, we've already bracketed or put me in an age bracket, but I kind of <laughs> feel that when people hit a website, they do I think some people do look for your blog. Um, and it's also just kind of an easy place to produce and, and, and post content. So, you know, I, I kind of believe in having a blog, but I also think a learning center, a resource center, uh, uh, you know, whatever directory you might want to put uh, other stuff in is, is fine too. I would say, you know, the whole key to this content marketing thing is to produce new content. And it really doesn't matter what the folder is called that this is put in. So again, if I think you said resource center. So if it's going into a resource center, but performing similar to what most people would think of as a blog, then I would, you know, and if it's working, I would just keep moving forward with that. If you feel like you want some place where you can do a little, you know, be a little more flexible and maybe have more personalized posts and provide an area where people want to comment or whatever, then, then maybe you could look at uh, starting a blog and moving some of those articles there. Okay, so keeping in line with the blog, uh, what role will video play in the future of content marketing? A you know, pretty key role. <laughs> uh, we at Vertical Measures are doing more and more for ourselves and uh, ex for our clients as well. Uh, I think every piece of data you see, you know, I, I don't know, we get asked this question all the time, and I don't know if the question is kind of coming from the perspective of hoping someone will say, it's not very important, don't worry about it, because uh, video could be kind of hard, but uh, it is, I'm absolutely <laughs> confident that it is the future. Uh, I I'll just talk to you for me personally. Again, older generation, but I think this even applies to the younger generation uh, as well. I used to be an avid book reader. I'm now consume, I watch video way, way more than I read, uh, read online or read books or anything else. Uh, I just, I just find it easier for me to consume and remember and understand in a video format. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're actually using video now in our outbound sales messages. I mean, in emails, we're, we're finding every way we can to use video and implementing more and more and more of it. Okay. Uh, we're going to wrap it up with, we have two questions and it's in your expertise of SEO. Uh, the first one is from Caitlin and it's, what is the most efficient way for building a solid backlink profile? <laughs> um, most efficient way. That kind of falls into that silver bullet thing. There really isn't, actually what I want to say, and it's probably true, is there really isn't an efficient way. Um, you know, I've been doing link building. Uh, well, I actually haven't done it now for a few years, but that's, I did a lot of link building myself and I view it kind of as a sales thing today, like the same as sales where you, it's, it is, it means real, if you really mean link building, it means, uh, you know, outreach and making people aware of your content and, and asking for the link. And, and that's just hard work. You can be efficient by having a lot of the right tools to help you find link opportunities faster and getting you uh, uh, the ability to outreach to that site or that site owner or webmaster or whoever it might be faster. Uh, the other thing though, I would tie it back to even our team that does a lot of link building here. When we get an engagement to do uh, link development, the first thing we do is look at the, the prospects or the client site and look for what we call linkable assets. So what content do they have that we are fairly confident another uh, organization would be willing to freely link to. And that that's where it has to start. So, uh, you know, to be most efficient, you've got to have something on your site and hopefully many things on your site uh, that people would say, gosh, this is pretty cool. This is really informative or this is really educational or this is a great list or whatever. I'm going to link to this. So it starts with the content. Okay. 
last one from Chris. Uh, what metrics do you look at uh, to understand SEO success, traffic volume, user experience, e-commerce metrics? Question mark. Yeah, that's kind of uh, uh, e-commerce at the end. There was interesting, but uh, you know, in the end, it's it really, really is for for your organ whatever organization you're representing. In the end, it's revenue. So that 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 trumps everything so if you can show through whatever attribution model you want to use whatever it might be what how can you show that your seo efforts your seo investment is driving more revenue for your business or your organization you know what, what nonprofit, whatever it might be that's that's the bottom line now generally we would start stepping it back saying, well, SEO organic traffic brought in this many leads or this many views of these product pages from an e-commerce e perspective or whatever. So then you can back it off and say, are we sending enough traffic to these, to these uh, pages, you know, landing pages, whatever they might be. And then if we're not, then back it off and say, well, you know, then do any of these pages rank? But I, I think you've got to always make sure you've got your analytics and everything set up correctly to be able to take it all the way through measuring as much from a, 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 a in Google Analytics, it's called a goal, but to, from the goal perspective to see if it's actually driving revenue. That's all I have on that. Okay, well, um... Thank you, Arnie. Uh, that, that I know that that was really great, and that's all, we covered a lot of digital marketing in that. Uh, so I want to thank you for taking your time. Uh, oh, this, you yeah, this is a lot of fun. Um, I do want to thank you for bringing up this slide. Uh, next month's <laughs> webinar will be uh, SEM Rush's Ashley Ward. She'll be presenting: Are you profiting from content? How to create content that generates ROI? There Something you go. We talked about today. <laughs> yeah, what a great transition. Uh, registration is already up. You can see the short code there, vert.ms slash content dash ROI dash webinar. Go there, uh, register for the webinar. It'll be next month on July 26th. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're really excited. Uh, I do want to remind everyone before you or when you log out, you're going to get that post webinar survey. Please fill it out. It's five quick questions. And also a reminder, follow us at Twitter at Vertical Measure with no S and follow along with all of our future webinars, blog posts, ebooks. And we have a ton of dogs that come into our office. So you get to see a ton of pictures of dogs. Who doesn't like that? Uh, so until next time, I am Zach. And from all of us at Vertical Measures, thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Arnie. You bet. Thank you, everyone.